Hello and welcome to this edition of Business Tomorrow. I'm Chris Bishop. Now this high-level discussion again comes live on both CNBC Africa and online on Zoom and Tube. I'm told YouTube. I'm told we've got quite a crowd today. So hello to you all. Look forward to your questions near the end of the debate. Now today we'll examine what can be done to turn the negative economic tide exacerbated by COVID-19 and also the important role in this played by the development finance institutions. We'll discuss how the economy can be re rebuilt post-COVID-19 with the help of public and private money, plus how the way can be cleared with legislation and regulation for a new sustainable investment in Africa. Let's have a quick look into the background. After COVID-19, the investment landscape is likely to be as challenging as it is uncertain. Most in business can barely recognize this new landscape and hazard a guess at what the new normal will look like. What will be left of investment opportunities in development finance in the wake of COVID-19? There is no doubt Africa is up against it when it comes to investing in its future to fill a huge infrastructure gap that runs into hundreds of billions of dollars. The prospects don't look good. UNCTAD estimates that global direct foreign investment flows could fall by up to 40% because of COVID-19. Yet, Africa was getting it right when COVID-19 hit. Between 2018 and 2019, Africa's direct foreign investment increased by 11% to 46 billion US dollars, following dips during 2016 and 2017. However, due to COVID-19, says UNCTAD, the continent's overall direct foreign investment inflows are expected to shrink by 15% this year. This negative effect of direct foreign investment will be concentrated in countries severely hit by COVID-19, but the effects will extend to other countries due to demand shocks and supply chain connections. What can be done to turn the tide? And what is the role that the development finance institutions can play in this? Clearly, structural transformation is needed to create more jobs, reduce poverty and achieve sustainable development objectives. Take the African Development Bank's High Five priority list. Feed Africa, light up Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa and improve the quality of life for the people of Africa. Where does this stand post-COVID-19? Dr. Hippolyte Forfak, Chief Economist and Director of Research and International Cooperation at Afrexim Bank, comes to us from Cairo. Dr. Bartholomew Armar, Director of the Macroeconomic Policy Division at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, who comes to us from Addis Ababa. Then T.P. Chocho, the Chief Executive Officer of the IDC, who's here with us in Johannesburg. And also, we'll be hearing views from Lerato Mataboche, the Deputy Director General at the South African Department of Trade and Industry. And also, Blaise Gazabira, Head of Strategy at the Development Bank of Rwanda, who come to us from Kigali. So that's our panel of experts expected on this show in the next hour. Unfortunately, there are bad news from Ethiopia as we speak is that Dr. Amar, who is going to link up to us in Addis Ababa, will not be able to join us for this discussion. The news out just in the last hour, there was a shooting and killing of an activist in Addis Ababa, and there's widespread unrest. And as a result, the internet has been shut down, and simply there's no way we can connect with Dr. Amar. But uh, also Lerato Mataboche from the DCI is not going to be with us today, but no matter. I spoke to her earlier uh, this week and we'll get an insight from her throughout the show. The first question I asked her was, as the economies of Africa are trying to emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic that we're suffering, what part, along with foreign investors, can development finance institutions play in trying to rebuild the economies? Development finance institutions have a critical, critical, critical role in helping particularly African economies to navigate the challenges of COVID-19. And to their credit, I think we need to also highlight the fact that the majority of African economies right now are coping with the crisis precisely because of the role of the DFIs. Um, 
for example, we've got um, our Pan-African DFIs, we've got domestic DFIs that are really making sure and setting financial resources aside to mitigate the immediate challenges of COVID. I'll give you an example. We've got Afrexim Bank um, as an example that has set up 3 billion US dollars for pandemic trade impact mitigation to ensure that a number of African economies are able to get emergency products and emergency imports that can um, assist them to cope with the crisis. We've got the African Development Bank as well that has set aside some funding to assist um, businesses, to also assist the state with their financial obligations that they have to meet during the crisis. Of course, domestically, we also have the IDC that has got about three different funds that are to um, support the competitiveness of South African um, enterprises during the crisis that are also supposed to assist with um, the procurement of essential goods and also assist with setting up manufacturing facilities that can help us as an economy to um, navigate the crisis. DBSA as well, critically, um, has also set aside some funds that are helping with our own National Disease Command Council for COVID. Similarly, supporting SADC member states to be able to get the necessary PPEs and, and, and COVID-related um, uh, requirements, as well as supporting um, vaccine, um, testing development, as well as uh, the development of ventilator technologies through the CSIR. So already as we speak during the crisis, our DFIs are doing an incredible um, amount of work and have actually set aside some resources to help us navigate. The question now becomes post the crisis at the recovery level when we have to now reconstruct our economies from the impact of COVID. Um, again, the DFIs are going to be fundamental and they're going to be important in us now reconstructing what is left of the, the, our economies. DFIs play, play an important role because they can serve as, if you will, anchor investors. They serve a strategic role of de-risking investments. Um, it's been argued that what makes DFIs critical to attracting um, other private sector investment or foreign investment is the fact that DFI money is patient money, right? So they can take a longer term view. They can take uh, larger risks, if you will. They can, uh, because there's backing of government, um, that also helps um, to de-risk particular projects. Um, so so it'd be important that our DFIs continue to play this role uh, post uh COVID and begin to facilitate even more intra-African investments as part of the African recovery story. Well, some of this is in action as we speak. In the last 24 hours, we've got news coming in here. The African Development Bank, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are pouring $1.8 billion into the transformation of Sudan. So that's uh, going on as we speak. Now we go to our guests here. Uh, we kick off the discussion here, starting with Mr. Nchocho here in Johannesburg. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it in the press in recent weeks. This COVID-19 has really uh, thrown a spanner in the works. Is there an argument, or how much of an argument is there, for like uh, a 1945 style Marshall Plan for Africa, similar to that which, um, which helped to revive Europe and uh, post-war Germany? Uh, thank you, Mr. Bishop. I think um, th that's a, a, a very important question. And the best way to answer it would be to say how deep has the adverse impact of COVID-19 been in order to answer that question? And I think all the economic assessment that has been done both by ourselves, the IDC and the various other organizations, the government and central banks and uh, the, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, all indicate to deep level recessions uh, across the globe. Uh, economies uh, that will be growing at negatives of uh, upper single digits or even double digits in the coming um, uh, months and years. So with that as a, as a basis from which we start, I do want to say that indeed there is a need for a Marshall Plan type intervention, something out of the ordinary. Uh, in order to lift economies out of uh, 
uh, what is going to be very deep and long recessions. Businesses are falling over everywhere. As you know, the IDC is uh, exposed and is an investor and financier of uh, virtually all sectors of the economy. And uh, if you look at what is happening in the tourism environment, uh, uh, if you look at what is happening in the area of manufacturing, uh, the steel industry is under pressure, particularly in South Africa. Uh, yes, there are certain uh, sectors that have proven uh, resilient, and we can talk about those. Uh, but yes, to go back to your question, extraordinary measures uh, are required, which will entail both government, the development finance system, as well as the private sector, and a lot of cooperation across countries and regions, I believe. So we can get into those details. Sure. Well, if I go now for a view from Cairo, from um, Dr. Vakvor of uh, Afrex in Bank, um, if you uh, look at it now, the amount of damage that's been done already by COVID-19, what do you think we're going to see uh, from not only investment, but the role of uh, development finance institutions in the next six to 12 months? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bishop. I think and uh, this is a very timely uh, session and I welcome the opportunity to contribute and to express and to share Africa's Simban perspective on this important subject. It's quite clear that this recession has been significant. It's important to stress that during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, when the rest of the world was contracting, African economy actually expanded by more than 3%. And this is the first time that Africa is entering into its first recession in over 25 years. So it has been significant. And we've seen the impact across all sector. And we mentioned earlier in your opening remark what has happened in the foreign direct investment space and whereby there was an increase to almost 42, 46 billion dollars in 2018. And important to stress that even at that level, and Africa was already not doing very well on the FDI space, the whole continent was receiving less than Singapore, which was way above 60 billion dollars a year, while Africa was at 42 billion dollars. I think even before the pandemic, which has set Africa on its sharp recession in decade, we were already facing constraint in the financing of African development, in the financing space. And these constraints in the FDI inflows have been exacerbated by the crisis. And if you look at the capital flows, March was a very difficult month for all emerging market economies with more than $84 billion exit in the developing world, developing emerging market economy, with South Africa alone losing $1.75 billion in the month of March of outflows. So you could see the significant challenges, calling for, as mentioned earlier, really exceptional measure. And so we have a region whereby the scale of resources needed to develop the continent were really so scarce, where it is in financing trade, the trade financing gap is huge, more than $90 billion, or in the infrastructure financing space, which is also huge in the same order of magnitude, if not more. So that is the setting. Then on top of that, you add the issue of increasing this premium, liquidity constraint, then you have a recipe for really major challenge as we see. Definitely, I think, in that space, there are two options. How do we respond to short-term emergency challenges while sustaining the regions on the growth path? It's important to stress that COVID-19 pandemic, which is essentially a combination of both global demand and supply shock, is exacerbated by the lockdown, is actually arriving at a time where there's been significant progress in the continent, whether in the macroeconomic environment, macroeconomic management space, or in the trade reform space. In the trade, in the macroeconomic management space, we've seen really what I call global macroeconomic convergence, 
whereby as a result of decreasing inflationary pressure, African Central Bank have for once been able to provide monetary stimulus to support the growth that we so much need under this difficult environment. If I can come back I to you. It's important, it's important to now go back to the DFI space that you mentioned. Sure. In the DFI space, it is very important to stress that DFI have the capacity to undertake counter cyclical response, which is exactly what African Bank and other institutions have been doing to provide the resources exactly when commercial banks and most other institutions are actually easing out. And the counter cyclical support by DFI is what actually we need to stop the bleeding and sustain the growth. And the same institution will actually play a major role in the recovery phase by injecting the patient capital, but also by drawing the leverage to bring more other institutions to the table through blended financing or the risking options. Let me stop here for a minute. Okay, if I just come back to Mr. Nchocho now here in Johannesburg at the IDC, one of the development finance institutions. Um, let's be honest, I mean, in the last few months, just give us an idea of the state of things. I mean, have you had many uh, investors coming knocking on your door saying we've got great projects will you come in with us in the last few months certainly uh, chris uh, remember what we did at the beginning of this COVID uh, situation was that uh, we were part of uh, uh, three development finance institutions in south africa who were uh, given the responsibility to provide uh, funding lines uh, that would make available emergency supplies that are required for the combating of disease. So we had uh, set aside uh, 800 million rand or so of that money, uh, of which uh, to date uh, 500, just over 500 million rand has been deployed. But I can tell you, <laughs> we had in excess of a billion rand worth of applications in that regard. So there's there's a, a massive uh, demand for support under these uh, circumstances. Of course, the second leg of uh, our area of responsibility is uh, trying to assist companies, uh, particularly our clients, to survive through this period at the moment. And yes, uh, uh, we have to provide uh, liquidity finance support uh, on a patient and uh, medium to long term uh, basis. Uh, we are also looking on a case-by-case uh, -case basis at uh, uh, providing breathing space uh, for companies that indeed have run dry in terms of cash flow and are unable to meet their uh, repayment uh, debt obligations. But we know, uh, based on our closeness to these customers, that their businesses are fundamentally sound. And indeed, uh, by God's grace, once we go past this uh, wave, uh, we believe uh, a significant number of the businesses will come on stream and re-establish their market positions and uh, drive back their trajectories towards uh, financial viability. But it is a medium to long term path uh, that they will have to travel. Um, as my colleague said, what is required uh, in this uh, economic recovery effort uh, is not only the efforts of the development finance system, uh, but uh, indeed, in South Africa, we know uh, government has made available substantial support package in the form of a guarantee package to underpin the credit uh, advances to be made by the commercial banking sector. So to that extent, it has to be a total effort. Uh, but what I do want to say, Chris, is that uh, uh, my starting point is that if we are to talk about rec economic recovery on the African continent, let us remember that as the basic starting point, as the basic thesis, I believe, the African continent still has runway for growth. Uh, this continent still has substantial uh, land and agricultural resources that need to be developed and exploited. This continent still has substantial mineral resources that are demanded in various parts of the world. And indeed, uh, normality will be restored over time in terms of demand and uh, supply chains across the continent. So this continent as well still 
uh, needs substantial investment in infrastructure in order to move goods uh, between the various uh, countries and regions of the African continent. So uh, it's a point that uh, is very well observed, i.e. that trade and the uh, implementation of the programs out under the Common Free Trade Agreement has to be lifted very high on the agenda. Uh, in the second instance, I've already mentioned uh, the need for um, accelerating the program on infrastructure development, which uh, uh, for so many years uh, the, uh, the, the continent has been focusing on. I believe energy and uh, uh, particularly uh, renewable and distributed energy systems where you don't have to build large and long expensive grid systems uh, are probably the answer to ensure people have connectivity to power sources so that they can run businesses. Yes, uh, the attraction of uh, foreign uh, direct investment or direct investment to say, and uh, our colleague from the DTIC mentioned earlier on that uh, development finance institutions as investors have the capacity to sit side by side with their uh, investors uh, and provide uh, the uh, investment capital to start up projects or to expand uh, uh, manufacturing capacities and, and businesses and so on. So these are the kind of things that I believe uh, uh, need to be looked at. The one thing lastly uh, at this point, uh, Chris, that shouldn't be forgotten is the role that small business development can play in our economy. Many of our economies are still uh, largely uh, small and medium-sized base economies. And indeed, I believe the programs for small business finance, particularly sort of regionalized and using digital uh, channels in order to make finance uh, as easily uh, available as possible, as efficiently available as possible in order to promote uh, uh, the development of small businesses. So okay. yeah, yeah, there's still more to say. Uh, perhaps yeah. I will pause it here at this point. Uh, okay. Well, you mentioned Lerato Mataboche there, our third virtual guest uh, from the DTI here in South Africa. Now, I asked her earlier this week about DFI. Surely, I said, they'll have their work cut out in this current climate. I mean, any project that's going on at the moment is going to have more risk and more cost attached to it than ever before. Absolutely. That's correct. And that's the reason why the DFI is termed as, if you will, financier of last resort, right? Um, the, the, the DFIs have to go where the commercial banks fear to trade, uh, where there's highest risk, where there's larger risk. That, that's the developmental role of the DFI. So there has to be a larger risk appetite because of the current environment that we're in. Another important factor is the collaboration among the DFIs to crowd in their own uh, resources because individual DFIs have finite amount of resources. But if our different DFIs, domestic ones, regional ones, uh, Pan-African ones, including global DFIs, begin to collaborate and crowd in resources, um, we can see a greater impact. Uh, for example, the OECD countries now have got what they call a DFI alliance of 16 DFIs that are going to assist OECD member states to navigate the COVID crisis, to also identify opportunities in developing economies um, for reconstruction. So those sorts of um, alliances, if you will, those sorts of uh, crowding in and collaboration uh, should be the, the new way of work for DFIs going forward to deal with also the issue of, of finite resources that DFIs have. And uh, throw into this, into the mix, something that I know is high on your agenda, the uh, proposed launch of the African Continental Free Trade Area. Where is that now? Um, and how does that fit in with the DFIs investing in the continent? That fits in very, very well. Um, the, ministers, the, the Council of Ministers has recommended that we move, of course, the, the deadline of implementation. Uh, that was meant to be 1st of July to um, a later date to allow economies to really focus on COVID survival, if you will, during this time where the pandemic is at its highest. But that does not preclude the fact that um, intra-African investments are going to be, if not the backbone of getting the, 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 the CFTA going. We need to begin to unlock African finances African companies and private sector uh, 
services and technical know-how to begin to play a role in strategic infrastructure, strategic manufacturing um, projects that have to happen on the continent that are going to ensure that the CFTA literally has life. Um, the future is not just about intra-Africa trade uh, as a standalone. The future is about intra-Africa investment um, as part and parcel of the intra-Africa trade agenda. Well, if I go now to Cairo for a bit of reaction on that from Afrexim Bank and... Uh... Our uh, colleague up there. I mean, you heard that. Um, the, even the African free trade area uh, and financing, it seems that uh, our colleague there from the DCI is uh, not too worried. How are you seeing it with all the changes that are going on in the economy right now? And I have to say that um, the African continental free trade area agreement has really been touted as a game changer for the continent. And the African Export Import Bank has been working very closely with the African Union on the design and implementation of the project because it has tremendous potential. And mind you, as we speak, even though Africa's share of the world populations are increased by almost threefold to 17% over the last 40, 50 years, Africa's share of global trade has actually decreased from about 4.4% to less than 3% as we speak. One reason is that we've not been very good at drawing on intra-African trade or intra-regional trade to build the original value chains that will then prepare us to transition into global value chains where trade is driven more by manufactured goods than primary commodity and natural resources. The African continent, that free trade area, will be a tangible response to that challenge. Yes, there's been a delay in the operationalizations moving toward trading on the free trade area, but it's a simply a delay due to the, the, the current environment, the COVID-related environment and challenges. It's not an expression of lack of commitment. I think the commitment on the part of African leaders remain very strong. And if anything, actually, the pandemic actually justified the need to quickly and solidly implement and deliver on the AFCFTA, in part because we've seen that during the pandemic, many countries have resorted to protectionism. And the good that Africa needs in terms of medical equipment and supply, uh, protective personal equipment, we could not import them, even the country which could afford, we're not able to import them as a result of policy implemented by various countries to first serve their populations. I think as a result of that, there's been a concerted effort within the continent to begin to manufacture some of these goods locally. And the pandemic trade impact mitigation facility that Africa Simbang has put forward actually has a strong component, about $200 million. We are working with UNECA and the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry within the continent to begin to address some of the supply side gap, supply side constraint, which will ultimately create a vibrant industry within the continent and reduce our excessive reliance on import of medication, which annually is costing the continent more than $16 billion. So it will be not just a tool, a mean for boosting intra-African trade in the medical and pharmaceutical industry, it will also ultimately reduce the pressure that countries are feeling on their balance of payments. And this pressure has been exacerbated by COVID. So we strongly believe that if there's anything, there will be more momentum come next year for a robust and strong implementations of the African Consented Free Trade Area, which has tremendous potential, not only in terms of trade, but also in driving in their investment both domestic and foreign direct investment as more company takes advantage of economies of scale and improve competitiveness of the environment. So I think we are very much in support of the AFCFT. Well, uh, if I can come back to you, uh, Mr. Nchocho, here at the IDC in Johannesburg. I mean, you heard what your colleague was saying there in, in uh, Cairo. Do you think with all this turmoil that exit pricing expectations and the like in some of these uh, DFI deals might change dramatically? 
Look, uh, I just want to say a couple of uh, things uh, in, in response, uh, Chris. Um, mm. uh, if you allow me, starting with uh, the point that was made earlier on by my colleague from the DTIC, uh, uh, Lerato, uh, regarding, you know, the uh, risk-taking propensity of a uh, development finance institution. Uh, she's right, and it is a very well-made point. Uh, however, I just want to take that uh, discussion and say uh, many of the stronger development finance institutions, particularly on the continent, one, they are government owned, uh, and two, uh, operate very much on the basis of their capital strength. So they run portfolios and uh, uh, raise money from open markets and uh, and deploy that capital and uh, need to then ensure that they are on sustainability paths. The first observation to make is that unavoidably, the capital strength of all development finance institutions, particularly the national ones, is going to come increasingly under pressure as our customers experience losses. And we all are going to see an upward tick in the levels of our impairments and write-offs and so on. The multilateral agencies such as the African Development Bank, I believe have an advantage in a sense that they have a wider uh, shareholder base and they are able to call on uh, member countries uh, to augment their capital base and therefore uh, continue their mandates uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, the point I'm making is that uh, the national development finance institutions such as the IDC, the DBSA, the Development Bank, uh, the Land Bank, will, working in partnership with national governments, have to have a look at their uh, uh, capital uh, capabilities. Uh, you know, Chris, that uh, any financial institution, uh, to Lerado's point, its uh, risk-bearing capacity depends on its capital base. And uh, when that capital base comes under pressure, uh, a DFI's risk-bearing capacity gets diminished. That's just a fact, a financial fact. And therefore, it is a matter that I'm raising that we, we are looking at and we need to apply our minds to. Uh, what are the options? What I've seen uh, one of my colleagues in East Africa has done is to you know, expand the shareholder base. Instead of having uh, six or eight countries as shareholders of that particular regional bank in East Africa, uh, its shareholder base has been expanded to include uh, investors from across the globe who have appetite for uh, developmental assets. And by so doing, it has enabled uh, that particular DFI to have more risk capital to deploy. The second thing to talk about is that I believe that the, 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 the economic environment today is going to demand more that public and private partnerships become emphasized even more strongly. Uh, no one country will be able to pull itself out of this uh, challenging economic situation by purely depending on its fiscal strength. It will have to require mobilization of, capital, mobilization of capital from the private sector to sit by side with public finance uh, instruments uh, in order to drive uh, investment in infrastructure, investment in the manufacturing sector, investment in agriculture and food systems. And well, this, I believe, also calls for greater inter-regional uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, to my colleague's point uh, uh, from Egypt. Thank well, you. Uh, hold that thought there. And uh, well, there's a case in point, regulation. What point, part can it play in attracting both foreign direct investment and also general investment by development finance institutions, the institutions that go where private money fears to tread, so they say. I spoke earlier again to Lerato Mataboche at the DTI and asked her how regulation can be eased to attract both foreign direct investment and DFI funding. Regulations 
generally have to be in the public good. So, so we don't regulate for regulation's sake. Um, and our view, particularly, I can speak for the South African government, I can speak for the DTIC because um, that is where I'm speaking, the perspective I'm speaking from. We utilize regulations uh, strategically to ensure, of course, uh, it's in the public good and to ensure long-term sustainability of whatever process we are regulating or project. That, that, that we are assisting with the regulations. It's for that reason that our approach has been um, very sector-based. So we don't have blanket regulation necessarily. Our regulations would be driven by requirements of you know, a particular sector and dynamics of a particular sector. And if there's a need then to utilize regulations to unlock or to um, ease uh, the burden of doing business or ease the, the, the burden of of attracting financial or technical flows into a particular project. We then use regulations on a case by case basis. Um, that is very, very well researched, data driven uh, expertise, advised, well consulted uh, regulations. So they play a strategic role, but, but we should not be driven by sort of one size fits all blanket regulations uh, as a way of investment at, uh, attraction. We need to you know, follow the model that we've been following and, and kudos to, to Minister. Patel because it's very, very clear as well about, about having a, a sector-based, uh, if not project-based uh, approach to how you set regulations in the public interest. What changes could also be made, do you think, to the financial system uh, in Africa to try to ease investment in the infrastructure that the continent needs very badly? Mm. Mm. I, I don't think that the question should be changing the financial system necessarily. Um, I think the issue is about changing perceptions. Perceptions around doing business in Africa, perceptions about Africans' own perceptions about doing business in Africa. Um, part of the challenge of us not being able to attract the necessary uh, financing to the continent is not for lack of opportunity, but as the president of the FDB said uh, on numerous occasions, one of the biggest challenges is that African economies themselves, when, when we have to raise financing for projects, for example, or, or bring in te technical expertise, we tend to go outward without necessarily bringing in African-based DFIs into our projects. Um, and, and, and tapping into African-based uh, expertise and very, very highly skilled, um, uh, you know, officials, if you will, or, or bankers that we have in our different DFIs. So there's an issue around, do we tap into our own homegrown solutions, homegrown institutions um, enough for us to be able to have successful projects on the continent? Um, would there be a need for financial architecture change or reform? I think that's a different conversation. Our issue right now, our immediate challenge is the perceptions around what African projects mean and the risk that is associated with that, real or imagined, um, and how we can begin to leverage our own homegrown institutions and our own homegrown pan-African solutions to make sure that we get to the infrastructure um, level of readiness that we need to get to for economic growth. I'll take this issue to my banking brother in Cairo, Dr. Fofak. Um, you heard there talk about regulation. I don't know whether you read in the news recently. Uh, in the UK, the Bank of England has suspended the size of capital buffer that banks need to set against lending to try to ease finance to help us out of this COVID-19 crisis. How likely is that that could uh, work uh, across Africa? I think that's the Bank of England. I think if you look at... Uh the EU uh, regulatory agency, I think last month they actually postponed implementation of IFRS 9 to provide more capital relief to bank so that they could ably support deployment of resources in response to COVID-19. So there are really a lot of initiatives undertaken by regulators and across the world, across the globe, to provide more resources and leverage to bank in tackling COVID-19. I think within the continent, there've been some effort in that direction. If you look at what has happened and the uh, step taken by several central banks, not only in lowering interest rates and uh, regulatory forbearances, but also a number of measures 
If you look at Nigeria, for instance, long to deposit ratios, before we've been talking about regulation to really attract foreign direct investment, there are a number of things that we have to do within the continent, within the financial system, to unlock private capital and to allow the SMEs that my colleague talked about to have more resources to sustain growth. If you look at loan to deposit credit to the private sector within the continent, if you take out South Africa and Tunisia, which are around 60% of GDP, you have country at less than 5%. Even Nigeria, one of the largest economy within the continent, it's barely at 15, 20%. So what the Central Bank of Nigeria has done, CBN has done, is to say from now on there will be a threshold of loan to deposit ratio, which will have to be complied to by most financial institutions. They took another mandate to make sure to get bank away from high yielding, risk free government security to promote more support to SMEs and to diversify the economy. So there are a number of steps that we can already undertake in the continent in terms of regulations to promote SMEs growth, to promote financing of local economy. But naturally, I think at the global level, and the, let me see, the writer mentioned that, and it was also mentioned by uh, the head of IDC, there is somehow what I call an overinflated risk perceptions when it comes to Africa. And if you look at what has happened in the continent in the last um, 10, 20 years, most shock which have affected African economy have been exogenous. Whether it is the pandemic as we speak, or the commodity super cycle and coming to an end in 2014-15, or the subprime crisis, they've been exogenous. Yet, the rating agency are always very quick to sanction Africans, even though what they're actually facing is not a risk of their own. So there is something to be done in terms of adjusting the risk perceptions to the actual risk so that there is a convergence, which will have implication not only in terms of foreign direct investment, it will also have implication in terms of access to capital markets. Mind you, the cost of fund for African entity has been prohibitively high, even in the context of a zero lower bound, where interest rates in advanced economy were actually put in the vicinity of zero or negative. And so we have to find a way to address that risk perceptions, which is highly inflated. Naturally, another important aspect that we have to mention is the issue of progress made within the continent in the area of macroeconomic reform. I think I've mentioned that earlier. There is no incentive better than a stable macroeconomic environment, inflationary pressure, exchange rate stability, which actually provide guarantee and certainty to foreign investors. Naturally, another important aspect that we can undertake in this difficult environment is the management of our assets, public assets, in particular, the foreign reserve and the pensions. How do we draw on these assets to strengthen the capital base of our critical financial institution to reduce the overall cost of fund. If we take the case of Afrexim Bank, for instance, we've established over the years what we call SENDEP, the Central Bank Deposit Program, which is to say, instead of having Central Bank, African Central no. Bank, depositing their reserve outside, let's put some of that within the continent. As a result of SENDEP, our cost of fund has gone down significantly so there are a number of creative, innovative action and steps that we can take already within the continent okay. to begin to address I'm the afraid risk. I'm going to have to ask you to stop your point there because um, I want to come back to Mr. Nchorchu. A very important question here. There have been loud calls here, and uh, I'm sure you know um, you've heard them, uh, for changes to regulations here, maybe Regulation 28 of the Pensions Fund Act here in South Africa, so that more money can be uh, freed up and invested in infrastructure in the future? Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a sensitive one, uh, Chris. Um, I think uh, uh, all of us uh, who are 
keen to see development and uh, transformation in the South African economy, speaking specifically, will agree that uh, the more capital can be aggregated from as many sources as possible, the better. I think where there are differences of opinions is on the how of it and the suggestions that have been made and uh, been met with uh, uh, opposing views and things like that. But I think if we stay with the problem statement, and that is that there is a need to make and enable as much capital flows into the economy as possible, then probably that is a starting point that could enable a meeting of minds. I mean, regulations are important. Let's have a look at the case in Mozambique, and I might not know the detail, uh, but what we know is that uh, uh, based on case examples is that Mozambique is at the moment, uh, uh, you know, subject to COVID, uh, experiencing a significant uh, investment in its uh, uh, gas sector. And uh, uh, it has done so by enabling through regulations and law uh, laws, the participation of uh, uh, a multitude of investors as well as a multitude of companies uh, to operate, uh, taking into account uh, the social and economic benefit to the country itself, uh, at least uh, the projects that I've seen. So development finance institutions come in and uh, co-invest and sit by, side by side with investors in that regard. Uh, the Afri Exim Bank is a, is a key provider of uh, risk mitigation instruments uh, for investors uh, in various economies, uh, be it uh, uh, you know, risks against political risk or expropriation or natural risk disasters or whatever the case might be. These are the roles that the development finance community plays in, in, in the economy. One of the things from a regulatory perspective that I've had come up, uh, Chris, uh, at least from South African investors, is also the importance of uh, African countries uh, properly and enabling uh, the repatriation of profits uh, because investors invest and they uh, are supposed to fetch a return uh, on their efforts. And uh, there seems to have been complications in certain instances. So, but I know, as my colleague from Cairo was saying, uh, there has been substantial improvements in uh, regulatory and economic uh, management environments over the years. So the one thing also that, uh, you know, development finance institutions could do more than just being financiers is to be strong implementation partners for government programs. Uh, you see a lot of that in the, the development finance uh, systems in, in East Asia, where governments and trusts uh, development finance institution with the execution of uh, the implementation of industrial zones or the implementation of large scale public infrastructure projects in the water sector or implementation of large scale uh, projects in uh, health systems or in education systems. I know the Development Bank of Southern Africa used to play a very big role in the implementation of uh, schools improvement and schools build projects uh, in rural communities in South Africa. Those are the kind of expanded roles that I believe going forward uh, uh, development finance institutions can and should play in an effort to drive the recovery in, in economic and social uh, lives that we are uh, hoping for. Well, let's hear just one Thanks, last please. time, sorry, for your colleague uh, Lerato Mataboche from the DTI. And I, I asked her whether or not um, the uh, return criteria put up by DFI should be uh, relaxed a lot more in the future to accommodate more projects. DFIs should use this time as well to reflect on what um, the development mandate means for a DFI. Um, as I said, DFIs, our understanding, they should be playing a role as a lender of last resort or where there's market failure. Uh, to replicate what commercial banks are doing is a DFI tends to defeat the purpose, right, of, of, of why a DFI is a DFI. So it's about being able to find that sweet spot, spot of what is the role of a DFI vis-a-vis -vis what is the role of a commercial bank and not uh, uh, facilitating an overlap 
because if commercial banks can render a particular service, they should render it. DFI should not be rendering a commercial bank service. Similarly, commercial banks should not be rendering DFI service. So it's about having that symbiotic um, relationship and finding the sweet spot of who does what in the whole value chain of finance. Look into the future now. Um, do you think now, despite the uh, terrible problems that all the nations and economies of Africa are going through, that maybe it's time for the continent to, to rewrite the way it tackles this whole issue of bringing in development finance institutions and foreign investment in general into the continent? Oh, absolutely. And a lot of progress has already been made. I think the conversations now, if you look at conversations that are being had at the African Union, at this point versus the conversations that we we're having say 10 years ago. Um, they're very different. Um, there's a, there's a, a level of urgency that now exists in terms of what needs to be done for in trafficker trade, for dealing with the infrastructure deficit that we have, because there's pressure. Every, there's no government that does not have the pressure of ensuring that there's inclusive growth. Citizens are getting uh, impatient with, with delivery and development. So, so there has been, at least, even if it's at the level of mindset, I think we need to give credit now to say we, we are at the level where we can have these conversations of how do we do this quickly? How do we deliver um, the benefits of development quickly? Leveraging not just DFIs, leveraging private sector, um, utilizing the muscle of the state, whether from a regulatory standpoint or whichever way of enabling um, that the state needs to do. So, so there's a, there's a, greater level of conversation. Um, the general distrust between private sector and government is, is, is being relatively reduced because we only need each other now. We're in the middle of a crisis, as an example. So government needs private sector. Similarly, private sector needs government. DFIs are the sweet spot in the middle that straddle both worlds. Um, so, so, you know, we are getting there. I think if we keep this momentum, um, having this conversation five years from now, it's that will have much more impactful uh, results-driven uh, and evidence-based conversation about where the African ghost story is. In Cairo, uh, you heard what uh, Lorato had to say there, but um, bearing in mind what she said that uh, everyone's got to, it's in their interest to talk to each other right now, what do you think is the best way to unlock balance sheets. A lot of companies are holding on to their cash right now because of the uncertainty. But what do you think would be the best method to get that, unlock those balance sheets and get that cash invested into projects for the future of Africa? It is already, uh, it is already happening actually. And if I go back to your previous question on the reform agenda, and there is no major reform than the one that the continent has launched on trade integrations. And if you look at the patterns of investment in flows into the continent in the past, they used to be heavily directed toward natural resource and primary commodities. They were like vulture investors who comes and get the diamonds out and the return are certain. They actually essentially sell liquidating investment now, as a result of the continental free trade area, we've seen the injections of patient capital. We've seen a shift in the patterns of investment. And one tangible example is Volkswagen investing, building a plant in Rwanda in that small economy, not necessarily for the Rwandese market, but I, Tanzania, Kenya, across the board. So the reform is already taking place in the trade space, in the financing space. Yes, more need to be done, but I think those are the conditions as we see increased competitiveness of African economies, as we see increasing return on investment, you will see a catalyst with more investors coming upstream and financing what is needed. But in practical term, and the continent has opportunity across a wide range of sector. I think the head of IDC mentioned earlier in the manufacturing sector, 
And I did mention about the pharmaceutical, but one can also look at the agriculture. In that space alone, the continent is spending almost $100 billion a year to import food. I think we should be able, building on those increased opportunity for economies of scale across the continent, to begin to move from small smallholder farmers into large scale farmers to draw on that large market and infrastructure developed to transfer from deficit from surplus production from surplus production area into deficit production area and reduce that reliance excessive reliance on import across all stream of good i think there are tremendous opportunity and what african bank is doing is not only focus on the short term through emergency relief but also redeploy the capital for long-term investment in a way that will actually reduce that recurrence exposure to adverse shocks in the medium and long term. So we are doing a two, two, two strange approach, one in the short term, emergency relief, but also more in the medium and long term, okay. by diversifying the export of the continent and diversifying the sources of growth. Okay, we're starting to get to our questions now from our online audience. And I come to you, Mr. Nchocho, here at the IDC. A uh, question for you. Now, it says, we've known before the COVID-19 pandemic what the African economic problems are. Now, COVID-19 has merely sharpened the glaring problems. Why is it that we seem to be failing to close the infrastructure development gap? Uh, yeah, it's a big question, uh, which uh, uh, can be addressed over a long period of time, but uh, this would be my take. Uh, point number one, uh, development finance institutions have done this, but they can do more of being the, the catalyst, the orchestrator of uh, infrastructure opportunities. So. Uh, if we know that, for instance, uh, I'm just making an example, a rail system has to be developed between uh, country A and country B or connecting several countries, it would be uh, for development finance institutions not to sit back and wait for the market to make the project happen, but rather to play that heavy uplifting role in the, in the front end uh, project development, project preparation, providing the seed investment in order to bring the opportunity to life. That's number one. Number two, as the aggregator of capital, as I said before, uh, being able to probably sit in a layer uh, that enables both public finance to come through as well as commercial finance to come through to aggregate large sums of money in order to make projects happen. And in the third instance, yes, uh, play a much more active role in the implementation of these projects. But I have to say this, uh, Chris, that uh, in terms of the infrastructure development program across the continent, uh, it cannot be resolved by money availability only. It needs adequate and conducive regulatory systems to enable things to work. I mean, uh, it is still uh, very painful if you see situations where maybe a hydro dam should have been built somewhere uh, between two countries in, 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 in West Africa. But for that hydro project to have worked, it required two or three states to sign a, a treaty amongst themselves that enables the uh, operationalization of such a project. And if the countries, from a regulatory point of view, are not able to find each other and enable such a project to happen, capital cannot follow. So I'm saying development finance institutions can do something. Governments must do something in terms of enabling a conducive environment. And thirdly, the private sector has to come to the party in terms of increasing its appetite uh, into this environment. Lastly, uh, uh, Chris, if you allow me, there's one thing that I cannot not mention in this discussion, and that is that as we uh, hopefully drive economic recovery, let us remember that our system of uh, finance and uh, economic development 
has largely failed the poor people who are at the bottom of the pyramid and has not been as inclusive as it should have been. Many studies across the world in developing economies showing that, yes, you might be growing the top end and increasing the middle class, but you still wish live with large sums of people at the bottom end who are not getting access to opportunity. Hence my advocacy for small business development programs. Hence my advocacy for regionalized programs, as my colleague was saying, for agricultural development, starting with small scale growers, uh, providing the growth capital to scale them up to commercial scale. And in so doing, really uh, distributing the economic benefits of growth and ensuring that uh, this tide as it, rides, as it rises, hopefully, it rises and lifts everyone else up uh, 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 going forward. Okay, Thank you, a, Chris. no problem. I've got a question uh, for Dr. Fulfak in uh, Cairo from our online audience also. Is, is there any collaboration of DFIs to focus on, say, specific sectors of the economy like reliable energy, supply and transport, which are critical to bringing about the African continental free trade area? I think definitely, as um, my colleague from IDC just said, the scale of infrastructure financing within the continent, it's such that no single institution can actually de deliver any, whether it is in the power sector, in the railways, or in the road infrastructure. A collaboration is fundamental. It's actually a necessary condition to deliver and close infrastructure financing gap within the continent. And I think we've seen a lot of collaborations. And for instance, if we take the case of Afraxim Bank, there's been projects whereby we've worked with regional development bank at the national level, with the continent, with the AFDB, but also leverage on our convening power to bring foreign capital into the financing of these investments. One tangible example, as we speak, if you take the special economic zone and industrial park mentioned earlier by my colleague from IDC, and Afrexim Bank has been able to bring in capital from China, China, China export, I mean, Exim China, to start the growth of special economic zone industrial park, which will create enclave to promote industrialization on the infrastructure constraints. I think that is something that is already happening. And the key issue now is how do we scale this up to actually now get into the power projects to address energy gap and deficiency. And I believe that the condition create the economies of scale created by the continental free trade agreement will actually unlock the constraint and create a condition for more collaboration between the FDI to okay. take advantage of increasing return on investment. Sure. Now, another question from the audience as well here for you, uh, Mr. Nchoto. Uh, this person says he's running a small social enterprise company working with South African solar product manufacturers, and he wants to grow the business towards East and Central Africa so he can manufacture mm -hmm. or she can manufacture these solar products in that region and create jobs. Now, he's asking the basic question, or she, is how can we get financial support for such a big project while our company is still small? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And uh, isn't it an interesting, uh, let me put it this way. If uh, uh, the, the caller uh, has a, a market opportunity access, so in other words, They've already identified uh, customers uh, into which they can sell such product. Then they probably have a relatively, if there's anything like that, easier problem. Because uh, uh, if they do have customers, uh, it is about uh, back solving for their capacity to supply such a, a market opportunity. By back solving, I mean uh, a development finance institution such as the, uh, the IDC would look at uh, do they have the uh, factory or the plant and equipment of the scale 
to be able to meet the size of the demand on the on the customer side. If they don't have, it will be uh, about working together with them to scope the opportunity to determine the size of the investment that they need. Maybe they need a, a medium-sized factory, not a big one. Uh, and then, of course, they would uh, have to work with us to work through the trade protocols. What does it take to take product into those markets, as well as the logistics protocols? Is this a product that will require transportation by sea, or they, can they move uh, products by air cargo, or can, will they require to move them by land, uh, which then talks to the infrastructure questions like that? So we do have a team here at the Industrial Development Corporation, which provides uh, what we call business support, pre-investment business support. So in order to provide the kind of advisory along the lines that I've just explained now, uh, and I think if uh, the, the, the caller is interested, uh, they can perhaps look at the IDC website and look at that uh, uh, service point of uh, pre-investment uh, uh, business advisory and see if uh, uh, my colleagues uh, could perhaps uh, get in touch with, uh, with them and, and assist. Okay, well, unfortunately, you are coming to the end of the show here. I've got one more question for Dr. Forfak in Cairo. Uh, someone from the floor asks, is there room for the development of a single currency, specifically for the ease of trade, following the uh, fr Continental Free Trade Agreement taking effect? That's definitely the best question for the last. I think <laughs> definitely we have to move towards a single currency in the future. And otherwise, and to align the monetary arrangement with convergence on trade. Otherwise, we run the risk of having what we call competitive devaluations, which will undermine the progress toward the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement during the implementation phase. That said, it's a difficult project, which requires establishing, meeting a number of criteria, what we call the convergence criteria, but in the end frames, it's very important. The move toward digitalizations has created a very dynamic environment, not only in terms of trade, but also in terms of currency. And we could actually begin as transitory step, move toward what we call the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, which will enable African countries to settle intra-African trade in local currency then Africa Simba will actually carry through the net and the difference, ultimately. And that Pan-African Payment Settlement System will create a condition that will remove the hard currency liquidity constraint, which has undermined cross-border trade, more generally African trade. So I think, as to your question, in the long term, we we'll definitely need a currency to accompany the trade reform, which require that mitigate the risk of competitive devaluations. But already in the medium term, immediately we could actually begin to use digital technology and specifically the proposed Africa Zimbang innovative solution, the Pan-African Payment Settlement System, to grow intra-African trade away from liquidity constraints. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, to both of my guests here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Hippolyte Fofak, uh, Chief Economist and Director of Research and International Cooperation at Afrexim Bank, who came in to us from uh, Cairo. Also, thank you very much to TP and Chocho, the Chief Executive Officer of the IDC here in Johannesburg, and also the inputs from Lerato Mataboche, the Deputy Director General of the South African Department of trade and industry. And uh, just before we go, uh, let's have a quick look at uh, what we can expect on the show in two weeks' time. Since the start of South Africa's lockdown level five on the 27th of March this year, the hospitality industry has lost 68 billion rand in revenues, and the hotel sector is expected to lose over 500,000 jobs. On a more local level, things have been tough for restaurants. 30% of the country's restaurants have already closed, according to the Department of Tourism, with lockdown level 3 easing up some areas in the industry 
and restaurants allowed to open up, things should start to lock up. But one of the concerns is that diners will not be allowed to enjoy alcohol on the premises of their favorite eateries. This also brings the world-famous wine industry into the firing line. How many of our favorite eateries and wineries will survive? And will we see a revival of the culture of whining and dining? There you are, that's what's in store for you. Wine and food on the 14th of July. Do come back with us here on Business Tomorrow. But for now, thank you very much indeed for tuning in to this discussion from myself, Chris Bishop, and the team. It's goodbye. <laughs>